Welcome to KTCA Reports. Join us tonight as we hear Minnesotans talk about race relations. We're not going to hear from experts, politicians, or policymakers, but from real Minnesotans. And I do think the judgment is made about a black man when we see him on the street, that he may be dangerous. M far before we make that judgment about what. Hello, I'm Robert Byrd. We usually think of Minnesota as a tolerant, progressive place, but when it comes to race relations, we're backpedaling. In 1950, black households in Minnesota made 85 cents for every white household dollar. In 1990, black households made 60 cents for every white dollar. And studies show this widening gap can't be explained away by just education or age. Most of it results from discrimination. Tonight we'll hear from black and white people speaking frankly about their feelings for each other. KTCA Reports has teamed up with the Star Tribune, so we'll listen to people who are part of the paper's roundtable discussion groups. Every month, the Star Tribune brings together groups of neighbors, like this one in South Minneapolis, so they can talk about different issues. This month, Minnesotans are talking about race. However, KTCA has changed the ground rules. A few weeks ago, we brought together roundtable members at this Edina home, but we invited only white participants. We separated the normally diverse roundtable groups by race in order to let people talk more openly about their feelings. We wanted people to avoid the Minnesota nice trap that can stifle dialogue. We'll begin tonight by hearing some of the Edina conversation. Then we'll come back to the studio to hear black roundtable members respond. And then next week, We'll go one step further by bringing together both groups, live in the studio. But let's begin by listening to the Adina group. Do you feel that race relations in this country are better, worse, or the same as 20 or 30 years ago? I think they've deteriorated, unfortunately. And I, I don't know. I think perhaps it's become OK to express resentment about a minority group where it wasn't years ago. We had such a push 20 years ago or back in the days of Martin Luther King and the freedom marches, the consciousness, a word I don't like, but for lack of a better word, I'll use it, of the nation was raised. And I think whites, for the most part, either understood that minorities of whatever kind deserved a better opportunity than they had, or if they didn't understand it, it became socially unacceptable for many years, um, to say some of the epithets that we were so accustomed to saying and, and to express negative um, uh, thoughts about minorities. And suddenly, in the last few years, it's become all right to say really some pretty scurrilous things about minorities. And you hear them about all, all manner of minorities. Neil, you really think racial slurs are more acceptable than they were in the recent past? Because I, I, I think of Marge Schott, and I think, my good, you know, this woman was, I mean, what is she accused of? Seven or eight sentences in her life, and this woman's in serious trouble and may have her team taken away from her because well, of that. And I don't, I don't, I guess I wasn't around in the 50s, but I, I doubt if that would have been possible at that point in time or I guess even in the 60s or 70s, I, you know, like whatever she was accused of saying yeah. is considered a much more serious issue now than it would have been at that time. But the thing that makes me think that it has become more acceptable is the very fact that she said it. What did she say? You know, oh, she, she um, called one of her players a million dollar nigger uh -huh. and said that uh, about a fellow that worked in her mail room, I believe, a black man, she said a monkey could do his job, and maybe she ought to just something to the effect of replacing him with a monkey. They were just awful remarks. Um, 20 or 30 years ago, we didn't see coverage in the media of um, black children being hurt, um, black people dying. Uh, they were ignored. 
and now it's so much more prevalent that we see news coverage of people of all races. So it seems much more prevalent, I think, but it, I think we, we didn't get the information that we had, that well, we have speaking, today. Speaking of the media, what do you think of the images that you see of black people and other racial groups in the media, particularly the news? I think you're horrible. Every time you, you pick up a, a television station, there's another one or two murdered that they're covering very well. They don't cover anything good. They cover everything bad. What kind of statement do you think the media is making through those images? Well, I can tell you what the media makes to elderly people. It scares the hell out of them, period. Is it so disproportionate, though, black or, black or white? I mean, I really have to go back and look at, but I look at some of the more sensational stories, um, and the, lo the, the latest sensational white abuse story is the couple who left their children yeah. at home. I mean, that's really good <clears throat> media fodder. Mm -hmm. So that is, that's headlined, and the, the black rapist is good media fodder, so that's headlined. But I don't know that it's actually that disproportionate. I see a lot of things in the newspaper and on the media that white people do that I think are utterly horrifying. But they're sensationalized. And I think when, in the issue of the rapist, that's sensationalized because there were 18 women raped, and it happened that it was a black man. I think it would have been equally sensationalized if it had been a white man they were looking for and 18 women had been raped by that man. Do you really? Yes, I, I do. I, I definitely I read a, do. Yeah, well, I'll tell you why. I'm, 18 I'm, women raped is sensational right, in I'm, one small area. Yeah, and I'm not questioning whether it's sensational or not, but I read an article today that said whites would respond to rape from a black perpetrator differently than they would from a white rapist. That white, white women? Because the or? black man is feared more than white men. What do you what do you think of that? I, I I'll disagree with that because I, I, there was there on a little girl up in St. Cloud that was murdered by a rapist. I think there was just as much outrage against Absolutely. him as That's there would be if he was black. Rape is a crime you know that means just as much to me no matter what the race. Uh, well no matter who's perpetrating it. It just doesn't make a difference to I me but I only represent me. I mean I, I, I know that there are others who feel differently who have uh, different backgrounds than myself, different, uh, come from different philosophies who may feel entirely differently but I resent as much of a black as a black person being categorized as to how I think or how I respond. Why isn't there every coverage on blacks that rape black women. I never see anything on that. How come? I'm, I'm positive there's a lot of black women raped too. How come that isn't brought out to the forefront? I'm asking you a question. Anybody got an answer? It seems like you want to make a point through that question. I want to make a point, yeah. Why isn't it reported that black women are raped by black men or white men? Well, Why do you think it's not reported, Bob? Because I, I think it's much more newsworthy when a black rapes a white than when a white rapes a black. And that's been done through ages. Why do you think it's more newsworthy? It's more newsworthy. It'll, it raises the attention of more people and it sells more newspapers. Do you think it also frightens white society? I, I think in all honesty, that that is so, that, that, that by and large uh, there is a fear that, uh, that blacks will somehow be more damaging than whites, I if, think if, I if feel we're going to be honest about it. And I feel that blacks have a reason to be angry. Maybe some of my fear comes from that. And I represent a society that has done wrong to black people. But I must say personally that I'm not any more afraid of an unknown black person on the street, a black male on the street, than I am a, a white male on the street, mm -hmm. if he looks a certain way. You may be ducking around an issue here, though. Uh, what I sense maybe was being asked is whether we think that there's some prejudice among whites among blacks. And I hear a lot of defensive statements saying that uh, that isn't so. There are other reasons, and I really challenge that. I do think the judgment is made about a black man when we see him on the street, that he may be dangerous. M far before we make that judgment about what, but I don't no, think we do I personally. Disagree. I think we don't do it personally, but I think many people do mm, it. Yeah, I'd agree to that. Let me th throw out a different point here. 
a lot of white people I've talked to have spoken about the waves of immigrants who have come to this country from Ireland, Italy, Eastern Europe, etc., and initially encountered, you know, great adversity, uh, poverty, but eventually made their way into mainstream society and asked, well, why didn't blacks do that? How do you feel about that? I think it's because black people don't help themselves and help one another. Most of these races come together, ethnic groups that came over to this country at some time or another helped one another. And I don't think black people help one another. The leaders of black society don't help one another. They don't form groups to, to, to train them in trades, to train them in businesses. You talk, talk about repression. Now, it may be that around the turn of the century, there were signs around the country of businesses that said, Irish need not apply. Uh, there were signs back in the, oh, middle, late 19th century, nobody wanted to hire Orientals. We had a large influx of Orientals. Then it became the Irish turn. But it consistently, we consistently had a pattern of major racial repression with the black race. They were slaves, first of all. They were owned by us and purposely not educated to keep them nothing but stock. They were treated like stock. Then they were freed, but they were, they were freed only in name. You can't be free if you can't get an equal education, have an equal opportunity to get a job, and those opportunities weren't there until fairly recently. I think there are lots of, lots more opportunities for blacks today than there were 20 or 30 years ago. Well, I'm thinking, you know, you know, I obviously have a different accent from when I was an Australian and I came here and I started a cookie company. But I started it without a penny. And I started it because other white people helped me start it. I went to accounts and they, even though I didn't know what they were doing, they all f found a way to help me do that. Is, is there not the same opportunity at grassroots level? I mean, forget about borrowing thousands of dollars from a bank, just down to a, a nitty-gritty level outside of education. Could not someone who wanted to do something, black or white, do that? The opportunity isn't nearly there like it is for white people. We can pretend to be anything that we want to be. We can learn to be anything we want to be. We can, we can study and practice, and people don't know where we came from. And we can convince people that we are, we can live the American dream. But we know that black people have slavery in their heritage. We know that their skin is a different color than ours. People tend to mentor people who look like them, who talk like them That's and act I'm like wondering. them. Yeah. I don't think the opportunities are there because we look at black people and we say they're not like me and I'm afraid I don't know what they think. Let me finish my point. My point was that now, not the past, now, in the future. We get a training program. Train them to be carpenters. Train them to be plumbers. There's a big black community all over you in, in every city in the United States. Train them to be tradesmen. That's a start. They make pretty good money. And why do you say that, not training to be lawyers or training to be physicians? Why I'm <coughs> saying that? Because most of them at the present time don't have an education to get to be a lawyer. They got to go through schools. You can, and I don't think you it's necessarily get... derogatory. I think I, I don't think all men were created equal, and I don't think all races were created equal. Because first of all, I don't think they were created. I come from a different perspective, being an atheist. I I believe in evolution, and I believe that you have to go back far beyond the slavery. I think you have to go back to the black race of where it started and what kind of climate, what kind of ecological environment which created what kind of a culture. And so when we're asking why can't blacks in America or in Western society become successful, we're talking about the kind of success that whites have achieved with the kind of uh, 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 the evolution that we have gone through of, of, of migrating to northern climates where you are more challenged to, to uh, overcome your environment, which creates a different culture. When you're talking about the, how different immigrant groups have different, you know, we were talking about how you define success, and um, people are always pointing to other immigrants groups that come in, in here and do just fine, or whatever, you know, that people point off into the Asian community. But it, it seems that the black community 
pretty much as far as we're all concerned is more of an indigenous community here. There's not a whole lot of people coming over from Africa these days. The majority of people are here, black people here, third, fourth, fifth generation at least. But it seemed in the black community, there's a certain segment of it that prospers from this situation. And, and it seems like the message that they send out is, as soon as Whitey f feels sufficiently guilty about his shame, then we're going to be okay. So just relax, kid. Don't play along with his game. As soon as we shame him enough and make him realize how much he owes you, then everything will be fine. And I think, and you, you see that in a lot of, of the rhetoric. The um, Reverend McAfee locally here, you, you read a, a lot of what he writes and says is pretty much, quit blaming us. It's your fault. And he may be completely right. Let's, let's grant him that. He's right. It's our fault. We br brought these people over here in chains. We pounded them down. And we've left them with a legacy of poverty. But nevertheless, us feeling sufficiently guilty about it will never resolve that situation at all. And it, it, in, as much as you want to assign blame, blame me. Blame all the blame we whole want to, in the whole world on race relations. Blame it on me, and I'll accept that blame. But that doesn't fix anybody's situation. And there is, is, is so much of an emphasis on pointing out how, how we've been so wronged, and not enough of, you guys have really given us the shaft, now watch this, type. And I mean not in a violent sort of way, but more of a take control and quit waiting for us evil white guys to get our act together and start playing fair because it's not going to happen. Everyone has their own interests. We're live in the studio with our Black Discussion members, and I want to open it up. Uh, Tony? What do you think of what you just saw? Well, and, you know, first of all, it's very tiring because it seems like we have to have this discussion about what folks think about us all the time instead of, you know, instead of trying to get past it. It seems like a lot of the people on the tape, to me, are like victims of listening to their own stories too much. That, you know, since having come here to Minneapolis, just my own experience has been, I came from Atlanta, you know, where I was surrounded by black folks all the time. And since I've been here, um, my perception of who black people are has changed, you know, dramatically to where now when I walk down the street, I'm more scared of black people than I am of white people. And I know that's a result of being around um, the stories. Because when I was in Atlanta, you know, it was the white people who I pictured as perpetrators of evil. But now I'm hearing this other story up here. And it's, if it's affecting me, I know it's affecting them. I think uh, just kind of to follow with what Tony was saying, we need to really look at the evolution of uh, racism in this country and what we begin to see is um, uh, how racism manifests itself again in some of these legal and uh, economic institutions across the country and how that impacts the lives of uh, black people, people of color, poor people, women, uh, and how it's been a steady and consistent pattern throughout. I don't think that uh, white men uh, are in positions to, to, I think that they feel as though they have a privilege that is, that is based upon the whiteness of their skin. And in order for us to move beyond racism, they would have to relinquish or give up that pri this so-called privilege and uh, act as equals, and I don't know that they're prepared to do that, and that concerns me. Anyone else? I don't think they're uh, prepared to do that, uh, but I think that there are things that we could probably do uh, sometimes to help ourselves uh, but I do agree with you that we need to understand racism much better and we need to understand how it works, how it has worked and its origins in order to know what to do about it. I think we have to look at that. Any other comments? What did you think of what uh, some of the people were saying about crime? I think that um, especially here in the Twin Cities area, the issues of crime and the African American community has really kind of exploded in our faces. Um, I think that oftentimes white people do look at black people, especially black men, in fear. And I think that um, that's basically because of how they're perpetrated, how they're, how they're viewed, 
And I think they, it's kind of like a cycle. They, they, they want to see them that way. They want to see them as something to be feared, so they do, because they don't want to see them as something equal. They don't want to see them as intelligent or um, able to achieve the same status. So instead, they just want to push them away and be afraid of them. I think I just want to make a, a comment again on that. When we talk about crime in America, uh, particularly in, in the state of Minnesota, uh, blacks are five times as likely as whites to be convicted of the same felonies uh, and just generally across the country. And here in the state of Minnesota, we're 19 times as likely as our white counterparts of being convicted of the same felonies. So you see an impact, a disparate impact that, that is kind of focused at, at black people. And um, it's not that we are more criminal, it's that the laws are designed to see to it that we are incarcerated at a much higher rate. What do you think of the closing comment of the young man who said, uh, well, you know, if you want to think of us as evil white guys, fine, he can accept that, but black people need to help each other? Um, well, personally, I look at um, the legacy of uh, the uh, problems that uh, black men and women have faced all throughout history. And uh, as far as helping ourselves, I'm seeing that that we're caught up a lot of times in trying to define ourselves from more of a Eurocentric perspective. And with that, I don't, I don't see that uh, we find ourselves um, as one as a nation because we're split uh, um, ideologically. We believe that if we go for the standard of white society, then we're okay. Uh, then we have like uh, uh, brothers and sisters who move from the communities that are making say fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, and they forget where they come from yeah. basically. And then we have an underdeveloped uh, community where predominantly uh, our black men and black women and children have to live. So um, I believe that he was trying to make a point that is based um, on I would say generally our lack of education of history. And I also believe that, um, I believe that people in the black community do help each other. And it's true that people in the black community start making fifty, sixty thousand dollars and the first thing they do is they leave the black community so that there aren't the role models that I think there, sh there should be. And for myself, I always just thought that, oh, I think I'll go to school and become a lawyer, become a corporate lawyer and leave the city. And as I've gotten older, I've begun to change my views and realize that unless people stay and take care of each other, that things aren't going to change. And I do want to become a lawyer, but I want to become the type of lawyer who is going to help create the change. Because I don't think until we get into those positions, like the law and economics, change isn't going to happen. We've got to bring ourselves and put ourselves in the position to make the change. I, I just wanted to make one comment with what she was saying. And <laughs> To that, to that extent, uh, blacks, uh, as a law student, when we're in le these legal institutions, they literally groom you to think along a certain line, to act a, to act mm -hmm. a certain way. And if you act counter to that, you, 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 it's, it's antithetical. You, you, all that you're taught in the law is, is opposed to fundamentally what you believe as an African person. And if you express that, you won't do well. Uh, you, you, your experiences are very different, and I don't That's think the law recognizes that. That you would say it like that, because I think in every school, you know, no matter what you're being taught, there's a certain point of view that you have to learn, or you don't get your degree. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. So I think that's just and part I, of being a member of society. Yes. And that's that's what I was trying to get at in the very beginning too. Is that that it just seems like it seems like. Um, the folks in the video don't really understand the amount of pressure that black folks are under to internalize, you know, this negative view that we have of ourselves and how that impacts on our ability to be, to be able to be um, thoughtful and productive citizens in our own society amongst each other. Nobody wants to live around a whole bunch of people who are um, killing and robbing, but then that's if you're true. in a poor neighborhood, that's eventually what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Tony, I have to interrupt you here. Our discussion tonight was very short. I know that's probably very frustrating for some of our viewers and frustrating for you. What? <laughs> You'll get a lot more time next, next week. Uh, and speaking of next week, we'll bring together our two groups live in the studio, the group from Medina and tonight's group, to continue where we left off. 
maybe we can make some headway in ending the misconceptions and fear concerning race in this country. Before we go, if you want more information about the Star Tribune's roundtable discussion groups, call 673-9068. That's 673-9068. And to comment on tonight's program, please call our viewer line at KTCA at 229-1430. That's 229-1430. For KTCA Reports, I'm Robert Byrd. We'll see you next week. edition of KTCA Reports is provided by the McKnight Foundation, responding to the needs of individuals and communities, Grand Metropolitan Food Sector Foundation on behalf of the Pillsbury Company, and by the Northwest Area Foundation. Additional support is provided by the James R. Thorpe Foundation and the Grotto Foundation.